As we approach the 40th day since the passing of His Holiness Pope Shenouda, I have come to London to spend some time with Metropolitan Seraphim to reflect on the life and legacy of His Holiness Pope Shenouda. Abu Seraphim, uh, in your view, how will His Holiness Pope Shenouda be remembered? Well, His Holiness obviously had a long time as, as Pope. He was 40 years as Pope. Um, and he came after an extraordinary pontificate, that of Pope Kyrgios VI. Uh, um, but he was a unique Pope in many ways because of the, the, the different circumstances in which he lived and also the way he addressed the situations that he found that were, confronted him when he became Pope. Um, so I think there's many things that we'll find that, uh, that are significant in his legacy and I, I'm sure that he will go down into history as one of the outstanding popes in the whole history of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Um, Abba Sefer, what do you think the, the major influences on Pope Shenouda were? Well, they were the, the, the two principal ones, I think, were as a boy he became involved, very involved with the Sunday School movement which had been founded by Archdeacon Habib Gurgis. And this was really a form of education for the people in the church. Habib Gurgis didn't believe that it was sufficient just that people were fed on the sermons and the sort of, um, that the, were preached in church. He wanted people to be more educated about their faith. And this is a, a strain that runs right through the ministry of Pope Shenouda, and of course he became eventually Bishop of Education. But for him it was very important um, to follow in the footsteps of Habib Gurgis, who um, founded the Sunday School movement. And in fact, right the way through, into all Coptic churches still have Sunday School classes, and they're, they're graded at different levels, from the very youngest people right up into people who are in adulthood. Um, so they're educated, they have a good knowledge of the Bible. And I think of all Eastern churches, you'll find that the Copts actually have a particularly strong and powerful biblical knowledge and founding, a foundation. Do, do you think that outside all his other responsibilities as Pope, he, he remained focused on education as one of his primary postulates? Yes, because from the moment he was first ordained a bishop, um, he started his um, weekly meetings for the people. Um, and these began, they were originally on Fridays, and then later on it was changed to a Wednesday. Um, but these, of course, and then he became Pope, and he, he continued these. And um, as you know, because you attended the, the meetings with me in Cairo, I mean, he, these were vast meetings where the cathedral was more or less full. Um, he, they were held whether, whenever he was in Cairo, only when he um, perhaps was abroad on certain travels where they can or he was ill latterly, they were cancelled. But right up to the very end, he kept these meetings going. And they always followed a certain format. I mean, they, they started off with religious songs being sung often by visiting choirs. And while the Pope was often signing um, books and uh, other and blessing various things that people had put on his table to be um, as, as mem mementos of him. Um, but he um, then proceeded to take questions, and um, people would send up questions, and he would answer these questions, dealing with everyday problems. Um, and that after that, he would then begin his talk. And this happened every, every Wednesday, right the way through, over that um, more than 40 years, because he'd already been a bishop for a number of years. So that was one thing that was very important. The other thing was, of course, his regular writing. I mean, he wrote um, El Caraza, he was the editor-in-chief, and that did, wasn't just an honorary title. He actually used to spend time every week set aside to write uh, a sort of column for that. And he wrote columns for certain other national papers as well, for Al Haram. So he had this desire to address things and to educate people about the Christian understanding of the faith and also the way, the practical way Christians live their lives. Abba Seraphim, what do you consider to be His Holiness's best book or what book do you think is the best ex exposition of his thoughts and view? Well, he, he, he wrote many books of course and they were translated into all different sort of languages. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, the book has suffered by the translation because they weren't always brilliantly translated. But one, funnily enough, you should mention it because I think it is, it's my favourite, is this one, um, Have You Seen the One I Love? And it was Contemplations on the Song of Songs. And what I like about it particularly is it's a very personal book and it speaks deeply of his own, the depth of his faith and the... the, the uh, commitment he had and love for our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. 
and it's beautifully translated. The, the, the work of translation um, has been terribly effective it, because you get the sense of the, the Pope's wonderful command of language. Because so often when you read um, some of the books that haven't been so well translated, um, you, th th this doesn't come through. And I um, mean, he, he was a, he, his English was extremely good, but also he had a, a brilliant command of Arabic and, um, and was a, a great linguist. And so um, this, this book represents and expresses that very faithfully. So I like it very much, and um, I, I would always recommend people to want to read that. Abba Seraphim, given that Pope Shenouda had potentially a very promising career ahead of him, what do you think were the factors that led him to kind of renounce the potential of the future and led him to become a monk? I think clearly his involvement with the Sunday School movement um, deepened his uh, um, faith and his pastoral ministry because he was, uh, many people you speak to who knew him at that time or you've once heard speak about him, um, speak about the, the warm way in which he guided and counselled them. Already he was showing a sort of pastoral side to him, holding them in prayer. People trusted him as a, as a spiritual guide. Um, but also, of course, he says himself that in many ways, although he had good friends and was certainly very popular among his students um, in the Sunday School movement and also um, with the other people who were start fellow students with him as well, he um, had a sense of aloneness, of as being a solitary. And he felt that the, 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 the attractions of the world weren't for him. And he, he trips, makes some reference in one broadcast, in fact, to the, the fact that his mother died when he was very young, before she could actually breastfeed him. And um, that there was always that sense that he was a solitary person, that he was a bit of an outsider. There was, there was this relationship between him and God, which is, of course, what is portrayed, in a sense, in that book uh, uh, about the Song of Songs. Abbas Seraphim, I'd just like to interrupt you for a moment. Uh, you mentioned that um, His Holiness had a strong aromatical bent. Mm. Um, what do you think within the monastery were the factors that led him to become a recluse for a number of years? And how do you think his time and solitude influenced him both personally and potentially his papacy? Well, of course, first of all, when he entered the monastery, he went to the Syrian monastery under Bishop Theophilus. And this was a monastery which had been revitalised by Bishop Theophilus, who was a remarkable man. Um, there's still much to be written about him, certainly in English, um, because there's, there's things in Arabic, but we, we don't have enough about him in English, which would be edifying for people, and I hope somebody will tackle it at some stage. So this was the beginning of a revitalization of the monastic life there. And of course part of that was that the monk in himself is a solitary, although they, they live in community. And so obviously as people deepen in their commitment to the spiritual monastic life, so there is the opportunity and under the guidance of their spiritual fathers and the abbot to go into um, uh, the eremitical life which he did. Now, I think that was always there because whoever surrounded the Pope was by crowds of people and even and by people who were important. He was not phased by it at all. He was very much his own man. So if somebody came along, you know, most of us would be impressed or perhaps intimidated by someone who was powerful. That wasn't the case with Pope Shuda. He was himself with everybody, whether it was somebody important or somebody unimportant. And he had that... that um, detachment from, as it were, um, perhaps the worldly way of looking at things. I think that, that had come to him from this um, monastic experience. Abba Seraphim, given that there were many hundreds of monks in Egyptian monasteries at the time, what do you think were the, the personal attributes that led to Pope Shenouda being selected for the episcopate? I think he stood out uh, as an outstanding teacher and a man of prayer and deep spiritual life. And this was recognized by many people around him. There were people I've met who knew him just as a, a priest and monk, um, and they, he was their spiritual father. Um, this was clearly something discerned by Pope Kyrillos. And I mean, the, the Coptic Church now recognizes that Pope Kyrillos was a, a man of outstanding sanctity and inside himself. And he chose people who were extremely talented and who he felt um, were able to offer something very particular to the Coptic Church to enrich it. 
and obviously education was one of the things, which is why, of course, Pope Shinoda was selected not to be a bishop of a diocese, but to be bishop in charge of education. Abba Seraphim, do you think it was a surprise when Pope Shenouda became Pope? No. Um, it, as you know, in the tradition of the Coptic Church, there are three names eventually on the short list um, and out of, who were selected, and out of those actually Pope Shenouda came um, second of the people by just the voting. But again, the Coptic Church has the system of the lot, and so the three names are put into a chalice, and during the Mass they are pulled out by a blindfolded child, and um, Pope Shenouda was the name that was selected. Now, that is very important because um, it means that however much um, people make decisions and use their, their wisdom to decide things, in the end, the choice is the one from God, the Holy Spirit, really truly does descend. And I think that's very important also because the Pope is seen not as owing his um, pontificate um, to any particular faction or group in the church, um, but in the end has been chosen by God. And that gives him, extra and did with Pope Shenouda, extraordinary moral authority um, when he speaks because you feel that this is a man that the hand of God has rested upon. Abba Seraphim, as Coptic Pope, His Holiness was not just another Christian leader of just one denomination in Egypt, but you know, in effect he was the leader of the largest Christian denomination in mm -hmm. Egypt. Never, nevertheless, the Coptic Church is a minority in a Muslim state. How did that, how, how did that reality affect church-state relations? And what do you think were the personal attributes that Pope Shenouda relied upon to influence, to influence his relationship with the government? Well, under Pope Kyrgios, there had been very close and warm relationships with, um, with President Nasser. And when Pope Shenouda was elected, President Sadat was already in place. And uh, uh, although they, later on, they, there was a problem between in their relationship, um, Pope Shenouda, only recently, um, Sadat's sister gave an interview with um, one of the Egyptian Coptic newspapers in which she explained that they'd had a good relationship in the early days and that Pope Shenouda had told him that he actually got on well with Sadat to begin with. But Sadat was, of course, under lots of... It was a very difficult time for him as well. He was trying to deal with the peace treaty with Israel. Um, there was a resurgence of, of, of militant Islam. And so relationships began to deteriorate because I think Pope Shenouda felt that Sadat was not dealing with um, the problems that Copts were facing at that time, which were considerable. There was already outbreaks of violence against Copts. Um, and so the relationship deteriorated. Um, and of course Sadat um, was assassinated in the end by the very people, the extremists, whom he'd, uh, in a sense, tried to appease. Um, the Pope Shenouda then was, of course, in the early years of the presidency of President Mubarak, was, was still under house arrest in St. Bishoy's monastery. Um, and um, only later was he released and went back to perform his uh, full duties as Pope. Now, all the time of Mubarak's presidency, there was a, a good working relationship. Pope Shenouda himself admitted that. Um, if he asked President Mubarak for anything, Mubarak generally conceded it. But there were also things that Mubarak could not control completely and so in recent years the instances against the Coptic Church of violence and um, injustice had increased considerably and alarmingly. Um, and the, the, the bro outbreak in El Kosha in 2000, as the world entered into the millennium, was a terrible one. There was the, 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 um, the shooting at Christmas Day at Naga Hamadi, and of course there was the El Qadassin um, um, uh, 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 bombing in Alexandria, which um, hit the world news, and in some ways acted as a catalyst for all the unrest that followed on um, linked also to the general problems in North, across North Africa with the, um, the, the Muslim states. So, but Pope Shenouda all the time had tried to work with the government. Um, what we need to remember is Pope Shenouda, of course, had been a, a soldier himself. He, he'd done his national service. He, he volunteered um, to serve in the army. 
And um, there was a, there's a strong patriotic streak, if we examine what Pope Shunda has to say. He, he, he didn't tell people don't get involved with the army. He actually used to say to people, it has many disciplines in it that are good for you and um, thought that people could benefit from being in the army. Um, and first and foremost, Pope Schneider was a very patriotic Egyptian. And he looked back to the time when there'd been good working relations between all sections of um, Egyptian society. In the Patriarchate, there was the symbol of the cross and the crescent on the wall. And that looked back to the um, early days when, in fact, the common enemy were, in fact, the British who were occupying um, Egypt um, at the time and using their influence, and all Egyptians united to look for the welfare and well-being and future of Egypt as an independent state. So Pope was very much out of that sort of mould, and so he, he always wanted to work with those who were in power. Um, he, the, the, the suggestion which is sometimes put forward that he was confrontational in his early years, I think is a very unfair one. He was always honest and outspoken about things, and he highlighted the problems. He never wanted to hide from the fact that cops were being badly treated, because that was his responsibility to, to look after his people, and also to call for justice. But he didn't do it in a confrontational way. He did it in a way that he tried to bring harmony and um, peace to a situation. And if he could work with the government to do that, then he always tried to do so. Abba Seraphim, Pope Shenouda famously said that Egypt is not a country in which we live, but rather a country which lives in us. Do you think that statement reflected the secular ideology that animated Pope Shenouda? Or did that reflect his theological view? Or was it a fusion of both? I think it was a fusion of both. Um, obviously, he was conscious of his um, Egyptian nationality and the Copts had this sense of being the children of the pharaohs. But also there was the sense that Egypt had a special vocation as a Christian country. Um, I mean, the, the whole tradition of the Holy Family having been in Egypt, and the only place out where our Lord went outside um, the Holy Land, which made it holy, blessed is Egypt, my people. Um, and the whole sense of the, 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 the land of Egypt was impregnated with the sanctity of those who'd, the, the people who'd been there. I mean, you find that in the, um, the, the story of St. Mina, who was carried abroad um, to, and died abroad, but then he'd been martyred abroad, but he was then brought back to be in Egypt. It was very important that his body was brought back to Egypt. And so the, there was that sense of it being a, a holy place and a holy land. But the interesting thing was that so often in Orthodox tradition, we find um, it can be twisted into sort of an, an ethnicity, um, which is unhealthy, which more or less says, well, we are the chosen people only, and therefore we're keeping our faith you know, to ourselves, and other people aren't, aren't welcome. And that wasn't, of course, the case with um, Pope Schnuder. I mean, there had been the historic links with Ethiopia and Eritrea, the Coptic Church, and so, and during his time, um, they became very important and were strengthened. Um, but also, with the spreading of the, in, of the Copts into the diaspora, um, and not only were the Copts moving and settling abroad and Coptic churches were there, but His Holiness wanted them to, in fact, um, have an impact on the society in which they lived. Um, certainly in South America when people came to him and said look we our own churches aren't ministering to us well we're not being taught the faith properly he said right we will bring people in from this he also saw his responsibilities in Africa with the the Africans who were converted and that process had started before his pontificate but it was going on and then particularly with people like the French Orthodox French Orthodox Coptic Church and the British Orthodox Church well, he wanted to bring us into the fullness of the faith. How do you think Pope Shenouda responded to the particular challenges of the diaspora? Very well, because at the time he became Pope, I mean, there were, there were just a handful of churches abroad, um, and he encouraged um, the Copts to establish themselves in those um, countries where they'd settled, and they wanted, and of course, because the, their faith was so so potent, and it meant so much to them, they wanted churches, um, and um, they were 
not only to establish their own communities, but to also um, link them to the motherland, um, and um, also to have a, a powerful witness in in that society. So, I, I think, um, and we see the way it's it, so many churches grew up. I mean, the, the places now where there are Coptic churches um, are, are vast. You know, in America, in Australia, in Canada, all across Europe. Um, there are Coptic churches, and Pope Shunda was interested in the development of all of them, and of course eventually consecrated bishops to serve in those places, um, and many priests um, as well. And if there wasn't a regular priest somewhere at, near the great feasts at Christmas and at Pascha, he would um, direct certain um, clergy to go out and celebrate the Mass for people during the, the period of the Holy Week or the, the, the festivities that followed. The other thing was also using monks to be planters of churches and once they were then established the monks would be recalled to their monasteries and then married priests would be ordained sometimes of course from those countries they sometimes were born or brought up in those countries um, in which they later ministered. Did the diffusion of the Coptic diaspora change and influence Pope Shenouda's approach to ecumenism? I think he used that as a means of um, e uh, extending the, his ecumenical vision. Um, he was very concerned to share the faith of the Coptic Church with um, other Christians and to enter into serious dialogue. And as you know, in um, 1973, sort of early years of his papacy, um, he made a uh, he signed a common agreement with Pope Paul VI. Um, over Christological matters. And this was, in fact, a very important m matter um, because it was the ba that proved to be the basis of the later discussions, of course, with the Byzantine Orthodox churches, um, which were already were in process, but which Pope Schuller again encouraged. So those early Christological discussions proved I invaluable in extending things. And often he, th he felt it was important to go in and deal with those very important foundation matters of Christology. So, for instance, with the Anglicans, again, Christology was the first important issue they wanted to discuss, and they felt that they'd got an agreement on those matters. There, there were issues, of course, obviously, where the Coptic Church wasn't happy about what was happening, and um, Pope Schneider sometimes um, uh, would be able... I mean, remember when he came to London um, and he'd been asked to speak about various issues, and he, in fact, didn't talk about this, the scheduled agenda at all. He decided to d discuss the issues of homosexuality and the ordination of women, two things which they weren't expecting him to discuss at all. And I remember saying to him on one occasion, well, why did some people thought that was rather bad that you, you, you intruded those subjects when they hadn't been put forward? And he said he did it out of love because he said if you, you love other Christians and you want to help them in their, their, their search for closeness to God and you see that in your opinion they're, they're, they're straying from the historic faith, you, you want to try and encourage and draw them back again. And so on one hand of course some people would say well this was a sort of bigotry, bigoted approach, you know, he was determined to thrust the point of the orthodox point of view down the throats of those who had a, a different perspective. But on the other, if you look at it from Pope Schneider's point of view, it was done out of genuine love and concern, brotherly love for those churches. In, in light of what you have said, and given that the, the latter years of Pope Schneider's pontificate were, had, were and continue to be dominated by the political situation in Egypt, do you think that Pope Schneider's contribution to ecumenism is greatly overlooked? Yes, and I think, um, I mean, that when, when, of course, he also, when he was imprisoned by Sadat, um, there was a great deal of movement among the other churches. Um, I mean, the Anglican Church was very strong in supporting him and keeping the awareness of the, the, the way he'd been treated and the, the, the problems faced by the Coptic Church, which, which as would be, appeared to be decapitated at the time, and the Catholic Church also. And so the, the, the great deal of common concern had grown up, and... And I think good relations had been built up, also on the ground level, because through the, as you, as you mentioned initially, through the diaspora, Christians were coming into contact, and people were beginning to see that the Copts were a, a very potent um, expression of the Orthodox faith. 
um, because cops have, have quite an evangelistic spirit in them and they, they're, they're not very good at just um, hiding their bushel under a light. They want to go out and spread and witness to their faith. Um, and they, they do it in a very positive way. So I, I think it permeated right through the church down to the ordinary church members um, and their witness. And that was led and encouraged by Pope Shenouda, who always encouraged the serious dialogue um, and wanted to see it continue. Abba Seraphim, as a Metropolitan Bishop of the Coptic Church, you perhaps had more privileged access to His Holiness than, than most. Uh, I'm wondering, is there one single event or a, a vignette that perhaps encapsulates your relationship with him and gives us a unique insight in, perhaps into his personality? Uh, yes, I was with him on one occasion and somebody said to him, Your Holiness, um, while you were praying, I noticed your, your eyes were cast up into the heavens. Um, what was it you were seeing? And they obviously were anticipating that he might respond and saying, the heavens opened and I saw the, the God in his glory and the saints and angels descending. But no, he said, well, I'd been standing for a while with my head down and it, my neck was a bit stiff, so I stretched it. They were somewhat surprised with the, result, the reply he gave them. But I think that showed very much the practical, no-nonsense um, approach of the Pope to spiritual matters. There was great spiritual depth and, and intimacy with, with God. But um, it wasn't something the Pope wanted to make uh, uh, into something that was sort of uniquely his or something rather sort of precious. Um, and... Um, I think that was very typical of him. He had this sort of common touch. Um, you felt you were in the presence of a very holy man, but he didn't have to sort of prove it. Uh, if I can give you just perhaps another example, we were going somewhere and um, we walked out to where his car was waiting. There was no one to drive it. And we I had my driver with a sort of battered bus we were travelling in. He said, well, that's fine. We were in St. Bishos once. We were going to the Syrian monastery. He said, I'll, I'll come in your bus then. And um, as he came out, they all they all sort of rushed out and said, no, 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 Your Holiness, you can't go in that, you know, get in the Mercedes and come in that. Um, but it didn't bother him. He wasn't at all bothered by that. Another occasion, we were actually at the Patriarchate, the former Patriarchate in Alexandria, and he and I got in a lift and we pressed the button and the lift went half of the way and then stuck. We pressed the button again and he didn't say anything, he just looked and laughed. He thought it was extremely funny and eventually, of course, the lift moved. There was no sense of his own sort of um, self-importance. This was not a man who was at all worried about what people, other people thought about him. Um, but there was a deep spiritual... Um, profundity um, to him um, that manifested itself and you could you felt that you were in the presence of someone who was particularly holy. Abba Seraphim, these are extremely difficult times for Egypt. What do you think the particular challenges for the successor of Pope Shenouda will be? Well I'm sure there'll be many um, because obviously Egypt has gone through many political and social changes in, in, in relatively recent times. But Pope Schneider always felt that God had been guiding the church and would guide those who came after him. Um, and I, I th we believe that when God chooses the person to be the next pope, he will receive that same grace and, and strength to deal with the matters. I, I don't think that we are cast down. There, there are difficult times ahead, but we're not cast down by them. Pope Shula took a very positive view of how he dealt with the future, always believing that God was guiding, strengthening and supporting his church. There are many godly people in the Coptic church, laity, clergy of all ranks, and God knows who they are. And I believe if the Coptic church is faithful, then God will give them the leader that he wants them to have who will see them through these difficult times. The Coptic Church has come through many worse times and God has stood by it and blessed it. And I think if we are faithful, then also God will give us what he desires us to have.